Hello and welcome to the second lecture of Natural Disasters. In this lecture, we'll be discussing internal energy in plate tectonics. So we look at internal energy in plate tectonics because it's through this understanding that we understand such disasters as earthquakes, volcanoes, and then indirectly tsunami. So when we look at the planet and we want to understand how the planet works um, to understand how these natural disasters work and how, why they occur, we have to start at the beginning of the planet. You know, we, we want to understand how anything begins or want to understand how anything works. The best place to start is at the beginning. So Earth is part of our solar system, which has the sun at the center and the planets that orbit the sun. In that solar system, it initially began as a rotating sphere, um, a spherical cloud of gas, ice, dust, and debris. It looked nothing like our current solar system today. But the gravitational attraction between the particles caused them to come together and, and to quote unquote snowball into larger and larger pieces. And then this cloud, as it was rotating, it contracted and as a result, it sped up, began to rotate faster and it flattened into a disk. And then we had the formation of the sun. So the most common elements in the universe are hydrogen and helium. And they're the lightest elements in the universe. So they concentrated at the center of this rotating disk. And any time we have large concentrations of hydrogen, uh, that forms a star. And so the pressure from this massive amount of hydrogen condensing uh, created a temperature uh, at the center that exceeded 1 million degrees centigrade. And there was so much pressure and heat that the hydrogen atoms began to fuse together, what's called nuclear fusion. And when you fuse two hydrogen atoms together, you form a helium atom. And in this nuclear reaction of two atoms fusing into one, there is a significant amount of energy released. And the energy released through the nuclear fusion is solar radiation. It's the light and it's, so the solar radiation is the light we receive from the sun, the heat we receive from the sun, all that radiation, all that light is the result of nuclear fusion, hydrogen atoms fusing into helium atoms inside of our sun. And that's the primary source of external energy, radiation from the sun. And in the second part of this course, we'll be focusing on external energy and how that feels such disasters as tornadoes, storms, hurricanes, and so forth. Right, um, and we see here a little illustration of this progression of the early solar system. So this rotating cloud, and it begins to flatten. You can see the debris beginning to condense into these rings, and eventually these rings themselves, the matter would condense into the planets. In fact, the asteroid belt looks like one of these debris fields, one of these debris rings. And the asteroid belt is a failed planet. Most astronomers agree that the asteroid belt exists because, well, first of all, the asteroid belt is located between Mars and Jupiter. But the gravity of Jupiter was so large that the pulling on this material in the opposite direction from the sun uh, worked to prevent from that, that material from condensing into a planet. So they call it a failed planet, but the asteroid belt is a relic of this early part of the solar system. So as this matter condensed in these rings, um, these con uh, concentric rings of concentrated matter begin to condense and collide to form the planets. Uh, on the inner part of the solar system, we have the what are called the terrestrial or rocky planets, which include Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. 
So they lost much of their gas and liquid because the solar radiation boiled them off, exposing just their rocky cores. The outer planets, Saturn, Jupiter, and so forth, um, even Neptune and Uranus, they were far enough away that the solar radiation didn't boil off all their gases. And so that's why Saturn and Jupiter are what we call gas giants. And Neptune and, and Uranus are, are far enough away that uh, it's ice. So those are called ice giants. And then soon after the formation of the Earth, very soon after the formation of the Earth, a nomadic planet named Theia actually uh, which was about the size of Mars. Mars is about a third of Earth's size. So it was a planet about the third of the size of Earth, collided with Earth. And this impact generated a massive cloud of debris that began to orbit around the Earth. And this debris condensed into a planetary body, which is now our moon. And so in that process, a lot of the lightweight gases that were, uh, were being held to Earth's surface were lost to space again. And so there's a lesser abundance of iron um, on the moon because the iron, most of the iron is in, on, in Earth is in its core. And so the material from the core was deep enough that it really didn't get thrown off during the collision. And so the, but the, the rest of the composition of the moon, it matches fairly similar with the composition of of the Earth, suggesting that it's material that came from the Earth. So Earth began as this aggregating mass of particles and gases, and this took a while, 30 to 100 million years. And this process was going on about 4.6 billion years ago. So our Earth formed about 4.6 billion years ago, quite some time ago. Okay, so these processes that led to the formation of the Earth they released large amounts of energy, huge amounts of energy. Um, and these processes include impacts. So as objects collide with Earth, uh, if you think they're, they're moving at thousands of miles through space, thousands of miles per hour through space, and then they hit the planet. And all that energy of their motion, um, it has to go somewhere because we know energy cannot be created nor destroyed. So that energy, some of the energy is converted into heat. There's also the, um, the heat given off by radioactive elements. So there's a lot of radioactive elements in Earth's mantle, like uranium and plutonium, and they're unstable atoms. And whenever they decay, which is whenever their nuclei or their nucleus falls apart, uh, that releases energy, some of the energy in the form of heat. There's also gravitational energy that's released as, as the Earth stratified as denser materials sank to the bottom um, and less dense materials rose to the top that produced heat. And also that a reconfiguration of the earth, uh, denser materials sinking to the bottom and less dense materials rising to the top resulted in a layered structure of the earth. Now, uh, there was so much heat that earth was in a completely molten state. So it was at this point in time, it was very easy for materials to sink to the center or rise to the surface within the earth because of its molten state. And while in that molten state, materials separated themselves based upon density. Just like if you have a bottle of Italian dressing in your refrigerator, you shake it up, the water and oil, they kind of mix, but if you sit it down over time, they separate based on density into layers. So at, on the Earth, the temperature rose above 1,000 degrees centigrade. Um, the iron in the Earth melted. This liquid iron is denser than the remaining rock. So it sank towards the center of the Earth to form the inner and outer core. So the Earth's core, which consists of, an, uh, of, a, uh, of a solid inner part and a molten outer part, is made out of iron, mostly iron, 95% iron, 5% nickel. And this sinking of this iron released gravitational energy that produced additional heat and the remaining rock on the planet was melted, allowing low density material, low density rock to rise to the surface and the denser rock to sink down and, and settle just out, outside of the, of the core. And the lowest density materials that rose to the surface 
uh, include the materials that make up the present day crust, the outermost layer of the earth, and then gases that now make up the oceans and the liquid and in the atmosphere. Say, wait, the ocean is a liquid, not a gas. Well, the ocean came from water vapor escaping Earth's interior and then condensing and consolidating on the planet. So a little timeline here, 4.4 billion years ago, uh, Earth has large oceans and small continents. This keep in mind is about 0.2 billion years after Earth began to form, which was 4.6 billion years ago. So that's what is 0.2 billion years? That's 200 million years, right? 200 million years. Uh, 3.5 billion years ago, um, we have the first evidence of life in the fossil record. That is photosynthetic bacteria that's uh, floating around in, in uh, coastal lagoons in the ocean. So little bacteria that are, that are uh, photosynthesizing. Two and a half billion years ago, we have large continents on the earth. And 1.5 billion years ago, we have plate tectonics as we know them today. Okay, so what are plate tectonics? If you're not sure, we will talk about that later. So those internal sources of energy um, are once again, they're the impact energy, the tremendous numbers of smaller bodies that are hitting the earth as it was forming, that, that, that energy of their motion and was converted to heat, the gravitational energy as earth pulled to smaller denser mass, the gravitational energy was released in the form of heat. Heat from both these early sources is still flowing to the surface today as heat conducts very slowly through the rock. But that's not the primary source of energy in Earth's interior today. Right? That heat is the impact energy and gravitational energy. That's heat that's left over inside Earth from its formation. Radioactive isotopes, as, as I mentioned before, unstable elements in Earth's, mainly Earth's mantle, which we'll talk about the mantle in a little bit, they are a source of heat. They are producing heat through the decay, the radioactive decay of those radioactive isotopes. So if you're an isotope quickly, it's just an atom that has a different number of neutrons and protons. And so whenever these radioactive isotopes, they decay, they produce heat. So it's actually a source of heat. Think of it almost as a furnace inside of the earth. So early earth, had much larger amounts of short-lived radioactive elements. And therefore, as much more heat was being produced than now. We have um, radioactive elements left today that decay away slower. So it's producing heat at a slower rate, but nonetheless, it is producing heat and keeping Earth's interior warm. And this is the primary source of energy that animates the planet, okay? The, the planet Earth is, is not a static planet. It is dynamic, it is ever changing. And in order for things to change, to move, there has to be energy. And this is the primary source of energy, the radioactive isotopes in Earth's interior decaying away and releasing heat. So all the sum of internal energy from impacts, gravity and radioactive elements, it's very large. Uh, internal temperatures on Earth have been declining since, you know, the early Earth maximum temperature, but there's still significant enough, uh, this temp internal temperatures are still significant enough to cause plate tectonics, which as a result, um, which, well, I guess, earthquakes and volcano, volcanic eruptions, they are manifestations or consequences of plate tectonics. And so plate tectonics is a process that occurs on Earth as a result of that energy trying to escape the interior of the Earth. So if you recall a few slides back, we mentioned that during Earth's formation, it stratified into layers, right? Where the densest material, which is iron, sank to the bottom and formed the metallic iron core. And then outside the core, we have rock. We have two different types of rock. We have mantle, which is a large layer of the earth. So this is rock with a lot of metal in it. And we have crust. This is rock with not a lot of, me not a lot of metal in, in it. And so the difference in the amount of metal is the difference in density. And so the rock with 
less metal is at the surface because it has a lower density. So those are three layers of the earth in terms of what the materials are made up of. So we have the metal core, the metal rich rock of the mantle and the metal poor rock of the crust. But we can also define layers of the earth based upon their physical behaviors. So for, for example, the inner core is a, is a solid while the outer core is a liquid. The mesosphere, which is the layer that composed, comprises most of the mantle, but not the entirety of the mantle, it's rock, solid rock, but it's warm enough that it deforms very slowly like a plastic, right? If you think about how if you would heat up metal to it's red hot, not to the point where it melts, so it's red hot, it becomes malleable, workable. You can de deform it and you know, it'll change shape, remain permanently deformed without breaking. It's kind of similar to that. Where then above that, you have this much thinner layer called the asthenosphere. It's also solid rock, but unlike the mesosphere, it's shallower, so it's under less pressure, so it's able to deform more easily. So it's like a soft plastic. It's like a, a red hot metal that's even more easily deformed. And finally, you have this very thin outer layer, which is outer layer consists of all of the crust and a little bit of the upper mantle that's known as the lithosphere. Being that it's the outermost solid layer of the earth, it's the coldest layer. So it's very, it's cold rock and cold rock is no longer malleable, no longer deforms plastically. It is now elastic to a point like a rubber band, elastic, uh, but like a rubber band, if you stretch it too much, it breaks. That's called brittle deformation. So the lithosphere is elastic to a point, but then it becomes brittle if it's deformed too much. It's unlike the asthenosphere or mesosphere. You can imagine it's kind of like Play-Doh. It doesn't break. It doesn't return to its original shape. Once it's deformed, it's permanently deformed. That's not what the lithosphere is like. The lithosphere is like you know, rubber band to a point, but if you deform it too much, it's no longer elastic and it breaks becomes brittle. And so, as I said, these layers can be described by the difference in density or their chemical compositions or the materials that make them up. And those are the crust, outermost layer, the mantle beneath that, and the innermost layer of the core. Remember the crust being mantle, uh, sorry, metal poor rock, mantle being rock that has a lot of metal in it, and then the core being pure metal. Or we can also define the layers of the earth, as I mentioned, by their strength or physical properties. Uh, as we said, the lithosphere is a layer that's defined as the brittle, cold brittle layer, and that's the outermost layer. Underneath it is the asthenosphere. And so the big difference between these two layers that are in contact with each other, the lithosphere being on top of the asthenosphere, is that the, the lithosphere is rigid solid rock while the asthenosphere is fluid-like plastic rock. It's still solid, but it can deform plastically. And then beneath the asthenosphere, we have the mesosphere, which is also solid rock, and it deforms plastically like the asthenosphere, but it's a little bit more stiff. It doesn't deform as easily. So here we have the lithosphere. You see we have, we have different thicknesses of crust. So here we have continental crust, Oops. We have thick continental crust. And we have thin oceanic crust. So remember, crust is rock with very little metal in it. Then we have mantle rock down here. And mantle rock is rock with a lot of metal in it. So these are two different chemical layers. But together, they make up the lithosphere which is the layer of rock, the outermost layer of rock that's cold enough to be brittle. So this rock breaks. I'll draw a fracture through it, it breaks. While beneath it, the asthenosphere, it's warm enough that this rock does not break. If you deform it, it'll change shape and it'll remain permanently deformed, but it won't break. So just like the metal, right, if you heat it up, eventually you'll get it to a temperature where if you 
bend it, it'll remain permanently bent. And it won't break. You can bend it a lot and it won't break because it's so warm. So that's like the asthenosphere. It's a very warm rock that is, the word is ductile or plastic. It, can, it deforms without breaking, but that deformation is permanent. It won't return to its original shape. So we know that ga gases, solids, and liquids, they're, they're obvious terms, but we need to consider them with respect to time. Over long periods of time, solids can actually behave like liquids. For example, a glacier, it's solid ice, yet over long time periods, it flows like a very, very viscous or thick liquid or fluid. Um, and so the rock in the mantle of the earth, mainly the mesosphere and the asthenosphere, they're the same. Like, they're just like the glacier where it's solid, but over long periods of time, it deforms like a very viscous fluid. So as I was talking about these different types of, of, of physical behavior or ways things can deform, I have them listed here explicitly. We have elastic deformation that's recoverable. That means if you deform the object, it returns to its original shape. Think rubber band or rubber ball, or maybe even a spring. Ductile deformation, it's permanent. When you stress something or squeeze it or stretch it over a long period of time or, or, or at high temperatures, it changes shape like an elastic object does, but the difference is whenever you relieve that stress, you no longer squeeze it or stress it or, or stretch it, it doesn't return to its original shape. The deformation is no longer, it's not recoverable, it's permanent. And the important fact is the material doesn't break or fracture, okay? Brittle, on the other hand, it's, it, it is permanent deformation like ductile, but it's whenever the object shatters, fractures, or breaks. And it often results from a material is stressed, squeezed, or stretched very rapidly over a short period of time or at very low temperatures. So permanent stress occurs when the yield stress is reached. Um, so uh, you think of an elastic band, right? If you stretch, if you keep on stretching it, it's elastic until there's a very point where if you stretch it anymore, it breaks. So that's the yield stress, right? That 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 amount of stretching or squeezing that that if you apply any more, the material will then undergo permanent deformation, either ductile or or brittle. The rocks at Earth's surface, they're at low temperatures and low pressures. Therefore, they deform either brittly or, or, or elastically. They're actually, they deform elastic up to a point and then they're brittle. I kind of like to think of the rock in the lithosphere as like one of those clear plastic rulers, right? You can bend it flex it and let go and it returns its original shape. It's very elastic. But if you take that plastic ruler and you keep on bending it and you keep on bending it, you kind of feel this state where if I know if I bend it anymore, it's gonna snap. And sure enough, if you bend it just a little more, it snaps and it breaks. And so that break breaking of the ruler, that's, the, that's brittle deformation. So rock is just like that. It bends to a point, but if you exceed that yield stress, it will then break. Rock in the asthenosphere, which is below the lithosphere, is ductile. It's soft like plastic. It's more like this material. If you squeeze it or stretch it, it remains permanently deformed, right? And then in the deeper mantle, the mesosphere, it's the rock behaves like the asthenosphere. It's plastic, but it's much stiffer because it's under more pressure because it's deeper in the earth. 
All right, so that's the uh, a basic intro to the interior structure of the planet and the properties of the different layers of the planet. At least the solid planet. So now we're going to start talking about uh, the very surface of the Earth and the um, and the atmosphere itself. So volcanic gases escaped Earth's interior. So early on, Earth was so hot that no gases could accumulate on its surface. They would boil off into space. But as Earth cooled, uh, gases were able to accumulate on its surface, being held to its surface due to its gravitational pull. Its gravity, the Earth's gravity was once it was cool enough, was strong enough to hold those gases to the surface and they began to accumulate. But where those gases come from, most of them came uh, from Earth's interior. They're trapped in its interior from its formation when the Earth was formed. And as these gases escaped through cracks and fissures or volcanic vents, uh, these gases were escaping to the surface of the Earth and accumulating and forming a very primitive first atmosphere. And these gases included let's see, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, sulfur, chlorine, and nitrogen. And those elements, they combined to make water, H2O, carbon dioxide, CO2, sulfur dioxide, SO2, uh, hydrogen sulfide, H2S, carbon monoxide, nitrogen, uh, hydrogen, hydrochloric acid, and methane. Most of these gases are still found in our atmosphere, except uh, hydrochloric, uh, you don't find that much hydrochloric acid. Or, or, or there is methane, but most of that methane comes from uh, natural gas leaks. So the dominant volcanic gas though was water vapor. More than 90% of the gas escaping these early volcanoes and volcanic vents was water vapor. And so also coming to the surface through volcanism was, was, was a molten rock. And that molten rock composed mostly of the elements of oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, calcium, magnesium, sodium, and potassium. Actually 98% of Earth's crust is made, made of these eight elements. And these eight elements, they would solidify and form uh, minerals and rocks uh, that are that are Earth's crust. And so uh, these eight elements are the most, basically the building block of the um, crustal rock on Earth. And so 40, uh, 4.5 billion years ago, uh, for, sorry, 4.5 billion years of volcanism has brought a lot of these lightweight elements to the surface that have solidified into rock to form the continents have formed gases such as water vapor that condensed out to form the oceans, uh, or were other gases that stayed as gases in the atmosphere. And including this material that was brought to the surface through volcanism, included uh, in this were the elements carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, which are the elements required for life as we know it, right? So, the elements that our bodies and all other organisms' bodies are made up of uh, were once trapped inside Earth's interior and escaped to the surface of the Earth through this volcanism. So we now know that the layered Earth, we have the we have layered Earth, the asthenosphere deforms plastically. It's about 250 kilometers thick. This asthenosphere, it comes very close to the surface, which means that the lithosphere is very thin at these features called mid-ocean ridges, which we'll talk about. And, it, and the, uh, the asthenosphere is very deep beneath the surface, more than 100 kilometers uh, elsewhere, mainly where there's mountains. And this very plastic, very soft layer, the asthenosphere that's beneath the lithosphere, it allows the Earth to be an oblate spheroid. What's an oblate spheroid? Well, it's a perfect sphere. If I can get my um, 
a perfect sphere looks like that. Oh, I mean, that's close to a perfect sphere. An oblate spheroid is if you take a, a sphere and you, you flatten it. Now, it's not that dramatic, right? But Earth is, the radius of Earth, or diameter of Earth, I should say, is larger at the equator than it is at the poles. And why is that? Well, because the Earth is rotating, and anytime you rotate, things are they want to go to the outside because of their inertia, and so that's why it flattens out because of its rotation. And also, this plastic layer, the asthenosphere, allows the continents, which are part of the lithosphere, to quote unquote float on top of them, and and uh, it does this through the principle known as isostasy. So isostasy is this idea. It's basically buoyancy. Most people are familiar with buoyancy, but applied to the earth. So just like a block of wood floats in water. Uh, and if you um, say, if you have a boat, right? And you put it in the water. Now, if you add weight to that boat, the, it sinks deeper into the water. If you remove weight from the boat, it floats back up, floats higher in the water. And why is that? Well, because the buoyant, the buoyant force, say this is a boat, is a force that a fluid exerts upward on an object. So if you submerge an object in water, you have its weight acting down, pulling it down. The reason why it doesn't sink is because at the same time, there's a buoyant force acting up and so those when those forces are balanced the object floats at the surface and the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid that the object is displacing so this object is displacing this fluid here the volume of the object that's submerged that's the volume of fluid that it's displacing and it's the weight of that fluid that's the force the buoyant force acting up so in other words, so uh, if you add weight to a ship, it sinks lower into the water. Why? Because it needs to displace more water to generate a larger buoyant force to support the larger weight. If you would unload the cargo, the boat would float higher because it's not as heavy. And it doesn't have to displace as much water to generate as large of a buoyant force. Well, the same thing happens on Earth. If we have very heavy, thick continental crust, it sinks lower into the asthenosphere, displacing asthenosphere. Why? Because the mass, or I should say the weight of this, of this lithosphere acting down is counterbalanced by the buoyant force upward that's exerted by the asthenosphere that's being exerted, that's being displaced. Now, it's, what's really cool is uh, there's some parts of the world, such as Scandinavia, which includes Norway, Sweden, and Finland, where sea levels are actually, uh, well, I guess it's uh, observed sea levels are actually falling, where most places sea levels are rising. And why is that clear? This here. That is because uh, oh. it's called isostatic rebound. Whenever you had that land, um, here's the here's the asthenosphere. This one's covered by a large ice sheet. And that ice was heavy and it pushed the land down. It had to sink deeper into the asthenosphere. And as we come out of the ice age, that ice melted. And so that weight was removed. So as a result, the, the lithosphere is rebounding 
it's bobbing up. Just like if you take the weight off of a boat, it bobs back up, it floats higher. So the land is actually bobbing up. It's moving up slowly. And so as it moves up, let's say uh, if we zoom in here, so here's, here's the land, it's moving up. And here's the coastline. So if sea levels would remain the same, as the land moves up, it would appear as if the sea level is actually lowering because you can't, it's not rising fast enough that you can feel it. So over time, if you'd measure, well, where is sea level? You'd see that, oh, sea level is getting lower and lower, where actually what's happening is sea level is staying the same, but your, your observation point from land is, is moving upward. But the sea levels are not staying the same. They are rising. They are getting higher, but they are rising at a rate slower than the land is rising. So as a result, the observed the change in sea level is negative. It appears as if the sea levels are falling, but really sea levels are rising, but they're just not rising as fast as the land is moving up. So um, we can see that 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 plastic fluid-like nature of the asthenosphere beneath the lithosphere in examples like that. So plate tectonics, which I'm sure most of you probably heard of, is the theory that the Earth lithosphere, that brittle outer layer of the Earth, is broken into pieces. And these pieces are called tectonic plates. And these plates, they uh, interact with each other along their boundaries called tectonic plate boundaries. And there's three different types of boundaries. There's divergence zones or divergent boundaries, transform faults or transform boundaries, and convergence zones or convergent boundaries. So it's the interaction of these, the edges of these plates in these boundaries or or the zones around these boundaries that are responsible for most of the earthquakes and volcanoes on the earth and the formations of mountains. And as I mentioned, there's three types of plate boundaries. Uh, divergent plate boundaries are plate boundaries where the plates are moving away from each other. The plates pull apart during a process called C4 spreading. So as the plates pull apart, a gap you think would form. But what happens is new there's volcanism there. And as the molten rock cools and solidifies, it forms new crustal rock, new seafloor. Um, and so the seafloor, new seafloor forms at these plate boundaries where there's volcanism. And that new rock, once it forms, it spreads away as the plates continue to move away from each other. So that's why it's called seafloor spreading. And we'll get a we'll get a we'll look at a illustration of this if you're having a hard time imagining that uh, later on in the lecture. Then we have transform plate boundaries. Well, these are plate boundaries where the plates aren't moving away from each other, but they're sliding past each other. All right. Uh, so instead of two cars driving away from each other, imagine two cars driving past each other, alongside each other in opposite directions. So the plates slide past you each other and these plate boundaries result in uh, earthquakes like divergent plate boundaries do but they do not result in volcanoes there's no volcanoes along transform plate boundaries and unlike divergent plate boundaries where um, only small earthquakes occur Fairly large, small to fairly large earthquakes can occur at transform plate boundaries. And finally, we have convergent plate boundaries. You know, imagine as two cars driving toward each other. This is where plates move toward each other and they collide with one another. And so large volcanoes can occur at these plate boundaries and small to, to very large earthquakes can occur at these convergent plate boundaries. Actually, the largest earthquakes on earth occur at these convergent plate boundaries. And it's at some convergent plate boundaries where lithosphere, uh, mainly oceanic lithosphere, lithosphere the oceanic crust, sinks back down into the mantle and is recycled or destroyed. 
So to kind of visualize these boundaries, we have this idealized planet here. It has three plates, plate A, plate B, and plate C. Now plate C, it's rotating this way, as this arrow indicates. Plate A is moving this way, and plate B is moving this way. So if we look at the boundary of plate boundaries of plate A, this boundary over here, since plate A is moving this way and plate B is moving this way, plates are moving away from each other. So that's a divergent plate boundary. Over here, since plate A is moving this way and plate B is moving this way, the plates are moving toward each other along this boundary. So this is a convergent plate boundary. And on the sides here, where plate A is sliding past plate C and plate A is sliding past plate B, these are transform plate boundaries. On Earth, this gap doesn't form because this is a divergent plate boundary here. And as a result, the asthenosphere, because the lithosphere is spreading, it's very thin, the asthenosphere near the surface, some of the rock here melts, it has volcanism, rock erupts, it cools and forms new rock, and that new rock is continues to be pulled away as the plates move away from each other. So there's a constant generation of new rock that then moves away as the seafloor spreads or diverges. That's why this is referred to as C4 spreading, the C4 spreading apart. So this is a divergent plate boundary. These plates are moving away from each other. Here we have a convergent plate boundary. One plate moves towards the other. In this case, we have very thin oceanic crust involved. Whenever it's involved with the convergent plate boundary, it sinks down into the Earth's mantle. Now that doesn't always happen. If there's two pieces of continental crust, they collide. Neither one of them sink. They just create really large mountains like the Alps or the Himalayas. And finally, where the plates are sliding past each other, like here, this plate moving this way and this plate moving this way, it creates a diver oh, sorry, not diversion, a transform plate boundary. All right, and so remember, we have along divergent plate boundaries, we have small earthquakes and volcanism. Along transform plate boundaries, we have small to relatively large earthquakes, but no volcanism. Along conversion plate boundaries, we can have volcanism, and we also can have small to very large earthquakes. And so the plates on Earth are constantly moving. And as a result, they're interacting with each other all the time along their boundaries. And the plate tectonics on Earth operate in what's called a, the tectonic cycle. This is driven by that internal energy of the Earth wanting to escape. So that remember that heat is trapped inside the Earth from its formation and that radioactive decay? We know heat wants to move from hot to cold, out from in. And so, and also the temperature increases as you go deeper in the earth. So this material here is much warmer than the material out here. So as a result, as a result, when you heat materials, you add heat to them, what happens is they expand and their density decreases. When you remove heat from a material and cool it, it contracts and it becomes denser. So this mantle rock down here, is remember it's solid, but it's hot enough that it can flow like a fluid on really long time scales. Because it's hard, it's less dense than the cooler mantle rock up here. So because it's less dense, it begins to rise. The warmer, less dense rock begins to rise. And how does it rise? It's solid rock. Well, remember, it's very hot. And on geologic timescales, on, on the timescales of millions of years, it can flow like a fluid. It can deform and flow like a fluid. So as this hot, less dense rock rises, 
Once it gets to the top, it spreads out, it cools, becomes denser, and eventually sinks. In this process of heat being transported from, from one place to another through material moving, it's called convection. You think this is how you know heat works in, in a room. You have you have baseboards along the the bottoms of your wall. It radiates heat. It warms the air right near the radiator. So here's a wall. Here's a radiator. Let's say this is a room. This air is warmed. Now because it's warmer than the rest of the air, it's less dense. So it rises. Once it gets to the top, it has nowhere to go but this way. Meanwhile, if air is rising here, it can't create a void, so air has to flow in to replace it. And, and as this air comes over here, it has nowhere to go, it cools, and it also has nowhere to go, but it sinks. Eventually, this air makes it back here, and it begins to be warmed by the radiator getting and rise. So we have this air transporting this heat from the source to over here. And that's called convection. And so the Earth's mantle is turning. It's turning, it's cycling, it's, it's uh, convecting due to the heat inside of it trying to escape that internal energy. Trying to escape. And it's that convection, the motion of the mantle, which includes the, the asthenosphere beneath the lithosphere, that moves the lithosphere. So this convection kind of creates currents that move the lithosphere that's floating in the mantle. So it's almost like there's currents in the water and the boat's floating in the water, those currents cause the boat to move. And so melt to the stenosphere, it, when it gets near the surface, it begins to melt and it rises pools at these mid-ocean ridges or divergent plate boundaries of one's new seafloor and spreads away. The mantle rock, meanwhile, is cooling, becomes denser and sinks. Um, and then where, where lithosphere is being pushed together, it's a convergent plate boundary. And if there's oceanic lithosphere involved along that converging plate boundary, the oceanic lithosphere will sink and cycle back into the Earth's mantle. If we have continental lithosphere and continental lithosphere involved, they just collide, crumple up, and create giant mountains. These zones where lithosphere, the outer layer of the Earth, sinks down into Earth's interior, they're called subduction zones. Okay, and this process is called subduction. And this cycle, you know, imagine for, for material to make the complete cycle is about 250 million years. So we have the Earth's mantle convecting. And as a result, the broken pieces of its lithosphere that are floating on the mantle or asthenosphere, they're being moved because they're the currents, the motion of the mantle, but through its convection are causing these plates to move, to pull away from each other, to push toward on each other or slide past each other at different boundaries. And so uh, depending on how they're moving results in different types of boundaries. We can have transform boundaries where they're sliding past each other. We have convergent plate boundaries where they're moving toward each other. And in some cases, one plate sinks beneath the other. It's called a subduction zone. And finally, we have other plate boundaries where they move away from each other called divergent plate boundaries. So here's an example of a divergent. So most of the plate boundaries on the seafloor are divergent plate boundaries called the mid-ocean ridges. Here's an example of a convergent plate boundary. This is a subduction zone where this lithosphere here is sinking underneath this lithosphere. And the San Andreas Fault in California is an example of a transform plate boundary.
So here's a map of Earth and the tectonic plate boundaries are mapped as well. The arrows indicate which direction the plates are moving. So for example, here, the plates are moving away from each other, that's divergent. It's divergent, divergent, these are all divergent. Um, here, the plates are moving toward each other. This is convergent, right? Here's convergent, convergent, convergent. So we see different convergent plate boundaries. And then here, they're moving, they're sliding past each other. Notice that transform plate boundaries are much shorter. They're not very long. There's another transform plate boundary right there. There's a small one right here. So, um, you can see these plate boundaries. Well, how do we map these out? Well, if you remember, I said that earthquakes and volcanoes, most of them occur along these plate boundaries. So if we map the locations of earthquakes, which are the red dots, and active volcanoes that are above sea level, those are black triangles, we pretty much recreate the map of the tectonic plate boundaries. All right, so we can see these tectonic plate boundaries by mapping the phenomenon that occur along them, the earthquakes and volcanoes, mostly the earthquakes. Uh, volcanoes, most volcanoes occur along, oh, I should say most volcanoes that are above sea level occur along convergent plate boundaries. Uh, divergent plate boundaries have a lot of volcanism, but it's beneath sea level. So there's volcanism happening all along this divergent plate boundary, but those volcanoes are beneath sea level. You have a few volcanoes that do reach the surface and they form the volcanic islands like, like the Canary Islands or Cape Verde um, and so forth. And subduction zones, as I said, are a type of convergent plate boundary and the largest earthquakes on earth occur at subduction zones. Imagine these two plates moving toward each other well, this plate is sinking. Right here is the boundary between them. And the rock doesn't just slide past the other rock easily because there's friction between them. What happens as this is moving towards it, it kind of, this rock deforms because it's stuck. It's, it's, it's the friction is causing it to stick. So this is moving. As this is moving, it's pulling this end down and the rock back here, continuing pushing, is causing the, the, the bow up. And so this rock is deforming elastically. Remember how we talked it can change shape, but not break, but it's elastic. So that means it will return to its original shape. Eventually the friction isn't strong enough to hold this rock together and the rock slips and it returns to its original shape. And so all this rock it suddenly moves, this rock slides up, this rock you know, moving down. As, and and uh, that motion releases all the stored energy on the form of earthquake. We'll talk more about that when we talk about earthquakes. But because there's just so much stress of these plates colliding with each other along these subduction zones, um, a lot of rock is deformed and the more rock is deformed the more energy is released and therefore the larger earthquake larger the earthquakes so here you can see a distribution of the depths of earthquakes on earth you can see most earthquakes are relatively shallow between zero and 70 kilometers because if you go any deeper your out of lithosphere out your out of the lithosphere and in the in, in the asthenosphere and remember the asthenosphere is too warm to be brittle. So it can't break or fracture. So it can't have earthquakes. The deepest earthquakes actually occur along subduction zones where the lithosphere is sinking into the asthenosphere. So we'd do a cross section of this. We'd see the lithosphere sinking beneath South America. So this plate is sinking beneath South America and earthquakes continue to occur in the sinking lithosphere. And that's what generates the deep earthquakes. So you can actually see the plate sinking underneath this plate 
by the earthquakes occurring on them. So these deep earthquakes and here over here, the plates even deeper and those deep earthquakes were 300 kilometers deep. So most earthquakes are shallow, close to the surface, but um, we can have deep earthquakes on Earth. And the deepest earthquakes on Earth occur at subduction zones. So some of the largest earthquakes occur. And this concludes the lecture on plate tectonics and the internal energy that drives them. Thank you very much.